Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome again to the second day of the Indian Heritage Center's IHC's inaugural seminar, which is going to be another day of interesting and insightful sharing. Yesterday, the seminar discussed the theme of roots and roots from a historical and community perspective. Today, the seminar will discuss the themes of Indians and little Indias in Southeast Asia. To commence today's session, let me welcome Dr. Gauri Krishnan, Center Director of the Indian Heritage Center, to chair the session and introduce the speakers. Dr. Krishnan, please. Very good morning to all of you. Um, yeah, so we are coming to the second day, session three. Um, and it's very heartening to see a uh, good turnout on a Saturday morning um, on the final day of uh, F1 race. So this is something really good to know, the commitment to community history and community matters uh, do count um, for all of us. Um, so just before introducing the members, uh, or the, the speakers for this session, I just wanted to um, make some remarks to the observations and comments made yesterday by Chairman uh, IHC uh, regarding um, the consultation sessions. And I would also like to highlight the fact that we embarked on this whole project uh, with uh, uh, a direction set by our former chairman, uh, late Dr. Balaji, about talking to the community and getting their feedback on the concept of the IHC right at the outset. And this has been the backbone and the fulcrum of the project, and we continue to do, do that on an ongoing basis, on a weekly basis, and our curatorial team has already accumulated over 100 interviews of some of the veterans who actually are amongst us today, and you heard some of them yesterday, uh, Mr. Dorai Singham, and also uh, we had a presentation uh, by our um, Parsi uh, veteran, and today we will have more presentations in both the sessions. So, and this was a very interesting suggestion, which I think has worked wonderfully uh, by Chairman Gopinath Pillai on combining the academics and the community members into different sessions back to back. So we get very interesting perspectives and we also gather the narratives, the parallel narratives. So um, I'm personally very enriched by uh, what we saw uh, yesterday and I'm very keen and looking forward to what's going to happen tomorrow, uh, today. I also want to highlight that uh, at the backbone of our research has been the publication and the research done before that by uh, Mani and Sandhu and the book, uh, the Southeast Indian Communities in Southeast Asia and East Asia has also been an inspiration and setting direction for our work. And uh, we again uh, like to say we go back to it like the go-to book. And we are very happy that it's been expanded and uh, uh, revised by ICS recently. Uh, I also want to touch on the point made by Dr. Uh, Mr. Kwa yesterday about the contact between South Asia and Southeast Asia tracing back the antiquity, which uh, most likely will be our next seminar uh, where we will have uh, scholars talking about pre-modern era and the connections uh, between the two regions. Uh, I just want to cite one very important Tamil uh, inscription from Barus in uh, southern Sumatra of uh, 1088 AD, which re refers to the merchants. And these are the uh, very noble and very uh, daring, adventurous merchants who were uh, uh, making their forays in uh, trying to establish um, uh, trade and uh, I would even say business because it's a guild of 500 strong um, 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 uh, traders. And there's also mention of other guilds like Mani Gramam and Nana Deshi guilds joining them. So there's already a presence of uh, southern Indian merchants in Southeast Asia, from, both from Coromandel and Malabar coast, as well as the Gujaratis, because we get mention of them in the Portuguese annals. So look forward to the upcoming, uh, to, uh, uh, upcoming seminars, which uh, we would like to arrange um, uh, following the success of this present one. And coming to the, this session, I have the privilege to uh, introduce two uh, very interesting um, research by two scholars. Um, and I'm very pleased we have more representation of women scholars uh, today. 
um, Jayati uh, Bhattacharya and um, uh, Ms. Salma Khu. So the first speaker uh, for today is Salma Khu, and she is uh, very well known to uh, most of the Singapore Peranakan uh, researchers and uh, community members. We are very pleased that she will be sharing with us her research on uh, the Indian community, especially the Indian Muslim community uh, in Penang. And um, now from coming to, from historians to sociologists, we are now looking at the precinct. So today's theme will look and examine the precinct and the significance of the Indian community in uh, not only Little India, we are also going to have later uh, Lakshman and Subaya talking about Market Street and uh, various uh, locations where Indians have uh, resided and done business. So we begin with uh, Salma Khu, uh, who, who, who is um, about to print her book, The Chulias in Penang, Patronage and Placemaking Around the Kapitan Kling Mosque. And she's also the uh, current president of uh, Penang Heritage Trust. And she also runs the Sanyat Sen Museum in Penang. And she will examine the, <clears throat> the role of uh, various Indian communities in the Georgetown uh, World Heritage Site, which is also the Little India, and the involvement of various uh, Indian, uh, not only merchants, but workers, and those who um, contributed to Georgetown and its uh, development into uh, the Little India today. And uh, she will focus mainly on her research on the Muslim, Indian Muslim community, which I gather from um, Nasir Ghani that she's pro probably the pioneer in this area. Uh, Dr. Jayati Bhattacharya, the second speaker, uh, she has a PhD from uh, India, and she teaches at, uh, she's a lecturer, and she teaches at the South Asian Studies Program in NUS. Um, Jayati has done a book on the uh, Indian uh, merchants in uh, Little India, and it is called Beyond the Myth, Indian Business Communities in Singapore. That was published by ICES in 2011. She's also edited a very, and con conducted a very large uh, conference and co-edited the volume Indian and Chinese uh, Immigrant Communities, Comparative Perspectives, which is in press. And here today she will be sharing her um, uh, documentation and research on the various communities that interact in Little India, the tourists and the inter-intra-Indian community that uh, um, sort of um, operates businesses as well as consumes uh, the various goods that are being uh, sold and how this space of cultural, economic, as well as social identity uh, sort of comes together and the various contestations that are uh, the hallmark of this uh, particular precinct. So now uh, I will invite uh, Salma Khu to make her presentation first, followed by Jaiti. Good morning, and uh, I'm very, I feel very honored to be here, and I have a lot to share with you. Um, let me introduce myself. My name is Khu Salma, because I'm actually straight Chinese but Salma is my Muslim name. And uh, why did I get involved in this research? One reason is at that time we were living next to the Kapitan Kling Mosque. We were living in Armenian Street and our house was just uh, next to the mosque, so we were part of the Karya. And then secondly, because um, we, I have, I've been involved in inventorizing the heritage of Georgetown, and I wanted to know more about you know, the fill in, kind of fill in the gaps. So um, there, were, there was nobody who was doing anything on the Indian Muslim history except uh, Professor Gulam Sawa Yusuf. He was, he's actually studying the performing arts and um, I, I think you should try and get him the next time. Um, so basically we saw a lot of old buildings, abandoned cemeteries, and we said, who did these belong to? Of course, many of the buildings are now taken over by the Chinese, but they are not Chinese architecture. So the architecture gives us a clue. Um, can we go to the next slide? So then I started on this uh, very foolish mission, which I thought I could do in one or two years, but it has taken me more than 15 years. So we have um, Penang, you know, was, uh, uh, became a British trading post in 1786 under Francis Light. And also in 1805, it became the fourth presidency of India. So we were actually 
you know, there were the three big presidencies and then there was Penang. And we actually have a book on that. We've published a book on the fourth presidency of India. Um, it's mainly about the European side of the you know, administration and so forth. But uh, you can imagine that it was really quite different from what it is now. In 1867, as uh, Rajesh Rai says, uh, is really the tipping point when you know, then uh, the British started to rely more on the Chinese. So you see that there's a kind of uh, pluralism that you have in Singapore. It's the same pattern. So, who are the people from India? So, these are uh, the groups on the left I just took from uh, Gulam Sawa. Uh, the, the Tamil, Malaya, Malayalis, Punjabis, Pathan, Sindhis, Gujaratis, Marathis, Bengalis, Biharis, and then Oriya, those from Oriya and Uttar Pradesh. And there were also others like Anglo Indians who actually came together with uh, Francis Knight. Uh, Parsis, Armenians, Arabs, and most of the Jari Pranakan I actually have a uh, South Indian or North Indian origin, and some very mi uh, small minority of Arabs, and so forth. Next. So this is now uh, part of the Georgetown World Heritage Site. You have the core zone and the buffer zone, and it's surrounded by the sea, so the sea is also the buffer. Next. Okay. Um, so you have the port of Penang. The port consists of two sites. So when I talk about Little India, I cannot talk about Little India without talking about the port, because that's how it grew. It's part of the port cluster. And you have um, how the, the trading took place was that the ships would anchor in the roads. And then you have the small um, boatmen and the lighters going to the ships uh, and then bringing the goods and the passengers because there, were, there was a lack of a very kind of solid waterfront. So the waterfront was sedimented and so forth. But later on, they reclaimed the waterfront and then you had... Uh, a pier, you know, a proper pier. So in the north, you have the pier for the Europeans, and then in the middle, you have the, uh, the dock for the lighters. And that's the Indian part, the second one. And then the third one was used by the Chinese. So there was a kind of division of space and of labor as well. Thanks. So these are the early maps of Georgetown. Uh, you have the 17, this was surveyed in 1791, the Popham map, and it shows um, very rudimentary kind of facilities. Uh, you have a mosque already and a tomb. Uh, and, and in fact, that would be the first um, house of worship. And then, you see, the, so the Chulias, what happened was that the Chulias were given all the area outside of the commercial town. Do you have a pointer? Uh, okay. But basically, you know, you have the commercial town which you see in the grid. But the British at that time were not interested in territory. They were only interested in a trading post. So the trading post is connected to the sea. Your territory is the sea territory, not the land. And therefore, um, the Chulias were working for the British. And they came with the East India Company. Some came as traders. And then they said, oh, this is good for the trade. So they gave them all this land, which is to the south of... Um, basically, southwest. Southwest of the commercial town, which is a big, big piece of land. And then later on, you see the first uh, Kapitan Kling Mosque. At that time, it's just called a mosque, like a masjid. And um, you can see the outline already in the 1803 map. Next. Okay. So how, how did this Chulis come? They came as uh, monsoon traders, and the people who came with the monsoon traders, so they would sail with the monsoons, which came... Uh, the southwest monsoon blew in August, September, and then after that you have the northeast monsoon, which was a, peri a period of calm on this side, and so they would be protected. Then they would trade, actually, uh, at first with course with Malacca, and then with Aceh and Kedah, and, and okay, even before that with Kedah. So uh, it, it, it really has a very long background history. So earlier on, uh, the, the Cholas were already here, of course, in Malaya, and Kedah was, uh, what do you call it, a, a landfall, landfall for the ships from India, from South India. And um, now what they found is that Kedah, actually the name does not come from elephant, it comes from iron, because they were mining iron, and, and Kedah was an iron mine, basically, for the Cholas. And then, uh, so then when the uh, British came, what they found was that the Chulias were the king's merchants. They were the Saudagaraja. 
So they were already controlling all the ports around the Straits of Malacca, and especially uh, Kedah and Aceh. So the, the British tried to get a foothold, they couldn't because the Trulias were blocking them. But later on, circumstances changed, and the Trulias decided, well, maybe it's better to be under the British. Maybe because they were, you know, there were kind of reprisals for certain things, and then so they said, okay, to the British, and then the British um, then gained the Penang territory. Hmm. So, um, so what, what we have to bear in mind is that one, uh, the Trulias already had a network and they had built up a network, and the British always, you know, kind of, uh, thank you, depend on an intermediary network, and in this case, it was mainly the Trulias. And secondly, that, um, uh, okay, secondly, that uh, the, the Trulias were, so what, you know, they, okay, they were, who were the Trulias? Because in the British records, they only say Trulias, but actually, who were they? So during the period from 1650, to around 1800, it was dominated by Muslim traders. Um, this is in some of the people who look at the Bay of Bengal. So I just rely on them because um, for some reason, I don't know why, but the, basically the Hindu traders were, had retreated and it was dominated by the Muslim traders. So the early history of Penang is very much associated with Muslim Julius. Next. So we have, um, like, for example, you can see from the Prince of Wales Island Gazette, which was the government gazette, uh, arrivals of ships and departures. So I've just looked at a few years. I haven't looked at the whole thing, but there's a lot of information there if anybody wants to do further research. So you can see, you know, European ships. You have some, uh, you know, like Kader Box is always the name of a ship. And, uh, so, um, and some of them were even carrying... Uh, these were probably Arab ships from Aceh carrying uh, uh, pilgrims to, to Jeddah, you know? Next. Okay, so this is a, a description by George Lee, which is very useful because he says that there are three groups. One are the permanent settlers. They have family, they have property, they have connections. Two, there are the monsoon traders. They come and then they stay for a few months and then they leave. And the third are the boatmen. And they come and they, they work for two or three years, and then they save some money and then they go home and they never come back. So they're replaced by their relatives. And this kind of, you know, sojourning and migration is part of a circulatory movement. At that time, it's not... Uh, very, very few were actually migrating. They were actually trying to go back as well, you know, just making the money here. But the permanent settlers are the ones that have local wives and so forth. Thanks. And then you see this, uh, it's a tribute to George Leith, where... Um, you can see that most of the traders uh, and merchants in those days were actually Muslim. So there is one Hindu, maybe, uh, Nakoda Hindu Keshma, and he's actually named as such. And practically, I think all the rest, or most of them, or all of them, are Muslim traders. So, and that's why we, I started to study the Chulias. Um, okay. And the, so the Chulias at that time, there were some Hindus, so it also includes Hindus. It, it doesn't tell you who are Hindus and who are, but you know, just circumstantially, you know that most of them are Muslims. Okay. Uh, next. Okay. So there were two very important uh, institutions that were established in early Penang. One was the mosque and one was the Nagor Durga. So as uh, uh, Professor Mani was saying, that um, the Nagor Durga actually served as a kind of uh, the, the deity for crossing the seas, even for the Hindus. And here you have, and you have a beautiful picture also of the Singapore Nagar Durga where it looks like a ship. See, it looks a bit like a ship like that. And, you know, you can imagine that there were so many, you know, workers, you know, the traders like, that were, uh, the trade, I mean, the workers and the laborers. And you can see that in this picture. But this, this uh, I hope you can find this picture because it's lost. Nobody can seem to find it anymore. It was reproduced in a book and nobody can find it. Next. And this is what it looks like at the turn of the century. It's, isn't that beautiful? And this is during a flag festival. So when, the, when they have the flag festival in Nagor, so they also have it here. But here there is no... Um, I mean, the saint is in Nagor, but it is a kind of like a... You know, uh, they, they reproduce them overseas. Next. So you have the Kapitankling Mosque, and this was the earliest one. And the founder of the Kapitankling Mosque, Gaudam Maidin, was from Porto Novo. 
So we know that the early traders were from Nagore and Porto Novo. And it doesn't look anything like what it looks now. Next. Here you have a picture of Pitt Street, which is the street where you, know, you have the church and the temple and so forth. And you have on the left, that is the old entrance to... It is not... The one you saw just now is the Trulia Street entrance. This is the Pitt Street entrance to the mosque on the left. And on the right, you have the Gopuram for the, the Hindu temple. So you have both on the same street. And you can see the, the, the different quarters which are in interconnected. Next. So, and then we have maps, so we do a lot of research from the maps where you can see everything that was there, whether they are wooden houses, they're brick houses, whether they have wells. And, uh, you know, so the mosque is actually surrounded by all the shop houses. By that time, they had to, to raise income for the mosque. They had already allowed people to build houses all around it. There's also tombs, there's mausoleums, there's all sorts of things. Next. And this is the Kapitan Kling Mosque in the 60s. So it was rebuilt actually uh, after the Mohammedan Endowment Board took over. And then, you know, they have a Brit British Royal Institute of Architects, trained architect, to remodel and to re reshape it. So they said, well, this is the British Empire. We, mu we must have something grand. And I think the Muslims wanted that as well. You know, they wanted that grandness, the neo Mughal kind of architecture. So um, I'll say a little bit about the Hindu uh, uh, temples. I, I must say that I don't know that much. But uh, this was established in 1833 in Queen Street. And nobody seems to be able to tell us very much about what happened between 1833 until 1933. So it was originally called the Mutumariman Temple. And then in 1933, it was rebuilt. And it was the first uh, temple, Hindu temple in Malaya, I'm told, that opened the door, its doors to the untouchables. And then you have the Sri Kunj Bihari Temple, which is uh, on Penang Road. It is just on the other end of Chulia Street. Chulia Street is a very important axis. And uh, it, is, it was built, believed to have been built in 1835. And actually, the North Indian uh, uh, communities, they share, they share this temple. So you have Punjabis, Gujaratis, Sindhis, Bengalis, and people from Uttar Pradesh. Is that correct? Yeah. Bayas and... Uh, so that, that is, um, it was uh, created by somebody called Kali Shampati, and the first priest was Kisori Sukul. And then you have the first, uh, the, uh, a very important priest that people know more about, who is uh, Pandit Sri Charan Patachaji from 1904. Thanks. Yes. Uh, okay. And then the Dato Koya shrine, which I, I have studied. Five minutes, okay. Um, this is very important because this is what we know about the Muslim, uh, I mean the convicts. This was a Mali Malabari shrine. So we know that he is a Malabari. We know that he was a convict. And we know that his shrine then became very important even for Malays and for you know, everybody, but Hindus, Muslims and all that. And then the Kadainalor people took over. And now they kind of have ownership of the shrine. Next. The Natukota Chetia Temple. Thanks. I think I have to go very quickly because I only have five minutes. And we have the Dobi Gout, uh, which is still functioning like this today. But if you want to interview, you have to do it now because I think they're going to disappear soon. Next. And then you have some temples which are associated with the Dobi Gout. Next. And then you have the Waterfall Hilltop Temple, which was also relocated about 100 years ago. But it's, it's very, very old. Next. Uh, then, okay, then uh, we have, we look at um, how, you know, the self-respect movement, what kind of impact it had in Penang. Obviously, you know, when the Mariman Temple opened its doors, it's because it's after the visit of uh, Pariya Ramasamy. And um, it, the Penang people actually tried to stop him. The Penang Hindu Sabah, you know, organized this, like, uh, gathering to, you know, vote and petition the British government to stop him from coming to Penang. But... But when he came to Benin, he had a huge reception. Thanks. And then you have, uh, because of that, you have the, like the Kadenalor community. They started their own Tamil schools. Thanks. Uh, 
And I just wanted to say something about the pot, and then you can just continue with the slides because I won't have time to. So I'm just going to show you some images. The pot ecology is very complex. You have ship chandlers, you have stevedores, you have landing contractors, you have lighter owners, you have subcon then they subcontract to the lighter men. Then you have the labor, co labor contractors, and then you have the dock workers who are divided into cargo stackers who are Muslim, and they are ca cargo handlers who are Hindu. So th this is the Hindu Mahajana Sangam. Actually, they got together in uh, 1935, started the Hindu Mah Mahajana Sangam. And they are the ones who carry the last Kavadi, the, the Atta Kavadi. Next. Okay, just go on. And then, uh, and then you have different rates which are paid, the haulage rates, the daily rates. And there's an, just go on. This is our Muharram. <laughs> and then, oh, this, this slide, okay. Uh, then I wanted to say, this is our Muharram. Okay, so, uh, just, just hang on. Okay, so I wanted to show that, uh, okay, our Muharram you had in Singapore and you had here. From our Muharram, the Jawi Peranakan developed something called Borea. Next. And from the evidence of Ibrahim Munshi, thank you, uh, you can see that the Jawi Peranakan were very sophisticated in their taste. Ibrahim Munshi, you know, went to Penang in 1872 and he said, oh, these are just the coolies, these are the... but these people, these Jawi Peranakan, they have refined taste, you know, they're gentlemen. And uh, I could listen to all these uh, like uh, Hindustani songs and they are played and they're performed and with the correct accent, you know, <laughs> so he was so impressed. Next. Uh, and, th and then these Jawi Peranakan, they were very affluent. So, you know, the identity is based on, first of all, the Muslim. Secondly, uh, the kind of culture that evolved, the Borea, the Bangsawan. Next. So I wanted to show our Parsi friend that this is Bangsawan. It, ca it came from Parsi theatre and they were performing in the, the courts of uh, Awud, the Nawab of Awud, or Lakno, right? I, I'm sorry, all my pronunciation is off. And um, then it evolved into Bangsawan because they started the imitation Parsi theatre, Wayang Parsi Tiru Tiruan. And then after that, uh, you know, it evolved, but everything was in Malay language except for the songs. So even in the 1930s, they said that in Singapore, they, they also have Bangsawan because the troops, uh, the Jawi Peranakan, the Queen Victoria Jawi Peranakan Theatre Company went down to Singapore to perform. And in Singapore, they had such a huge reception. They went to Indonesia, they had to Java, where it's called um, uh, Wayang Istanbul, Istanbul, because, you know, but they had a huge reception. The, the actresses were so pretty, the costumes were so lovely, you know, they had fairies with strings and all that. And then uh, in Singapore, they had used mainly adapted European songs and Shakespearean plays, like Othello, Hamlet, and so forth. In Penang, you also had Shakespearean plays uh, performed in Malay for everybody, multicultural audience. Okay, thanks. Uh, but in Penang, they still prefer Hindustani songs. That's what they say. Okay, and you can just show the rest of the slides if you can. You know. Okay, I won't. I won't go in. Th thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, well, that was a very, very interesting, uh, you know, all those pictures. I wish you could have time to, to explain us more about this. I've been personally interested in it. That, but now we come to uh, <clears throat> Little India in Singapore. And uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Indian Heritage uh, Center, for giving me this opportunity to come and share my thoughts uh, with you. It's a very insightful experience where uh, I'm sure many in the audience would know uh, a lot uh, about the space that I'm going to talk about. It's just my, my perspective about it. Um, and uh, of course, with, within the framework of 20 minutes, let's see what we can do. <clears throat> okay. Attachment of a community through common physical space is no more a necessity with modern conditions of living and technological innovations that have facilitated virtual connectivities in the people-to-people -people interactions across the globe. Yet, in the global setting of Singapore, the territorial periphery of today's Little India does give us a reference point of the community. However problematic the homogenization of the term Indian community might be, 
The community space may be regarded as a physical domination of the particular community within the identified living space. There may also be the factor of the state's encouragement and handiwork of creating one. Now, this has been discussed on several occasions, and we'll discuss a little of this as we go along. But Little India is a new coinage of the Indian community space in the Serangoon Road area since colonial times. What I would like to explore in my presentation is to look at the reflections of the past imageries. Um, yeah, thank you. Of this community space into the present through the sites of business and market interactions, the changes that have been observed through the generations, and how that has resonated with the impressions of this space in popular imagination. I would like to discuss with how within the familiar architectural landscapes from the past, the business trajectories of Little India have been redefined with significantly increasing footsteps of the ethnic Chinese businessmen in the area, operating with unique methods and strategies within the sphere of an Indian way of life. I, I, give an, I make a case study of the gold jewelry business, which I, I, I hope I'll have a little time to talk about. Um, I think we'll go to the next slide, yeah. It all started with Raffles and his system of town planning, where racial d distinction was sought through the creation of enclaves, Chinatown, Kampung Glam, uh, Sarangun Road, and others. I think this is, uh, this is a, a picture that Dr. Nirmala uh, uh, tried to show. I have, I have gained copyright permission, so I can show this on the slide. Um, that is, that it generated a sense of some sort of mutual adjustments between the migrant communities who were radically different from each other culturally and linguistically, and the administrative institution who maintained a divisiveness to ensure a safety net against an united uprising of any kind. So it, it kind of um, served both the purposes. This awareness, and, and for the administrative institution, this was not, this, this uh, kind of divisive tendencies that were recreated in different kind of geographical spaces that they were influencing. Um, this awareness has created in conventional, uh, sorry, this awareness has existed in conventional historiography. It may be mentioned that there were other areas of dominant physical presence of the Indian community across the island in the colonial days, especially in terms of business operations like the Market Street, Chulia Street, and the High Street, which because of the nature of the migrant population who are most, almost exclusively male and single, served as residential areas as well. And same goes for Little India as well. I mean, Little India now. Indians working in naval bases, dockyards, and ports were clustered around Sembawang Naval Base, Tanjong Pagar area, etc. Uh, just to make the point that, you know, Serangoon Road was not the only area which was identified with the Indian space. There were uh, areas which were um, there in the colonial past and maybe in the, just in the post-colonial days as well. And um, if I can go back to what um, Gauri was suggesting, I, I, my book is not only on Little India, it's on the Indian uh, business communities across uh, Singapore. So uh, I'm talking about other spaces in my book also. Um, Architectural landscapes in Market Street and High Street had altered radically, as did the demographic profile in the process of urban renewal and development since the post-independent days. However, the case of Little India has been an exception. Part of the effort, we can go to the next slide, I think this is um, where uh, we, I look at the changing landscapes. Um, however, part of the effort to maintain the striking similarity to its former avatar had been the effort of the government. The name Little India was coined in the 1970s by the Singapore Tourism Board and identified as a popular tourist destination, thus encouraging formal public identification as the Indian space. The result has been that of an ex exceptional experience. Once in Little India, one is transported to a completely different world from the rest of the cityscape that emanates um, modernization, mechanization, and optimum use of advanced technological innovations. A step into Little India would mean confrontation with vibrant, colorful, informal world of jostling crowd, blaring music, mixed aroma of incense steaks, garlands, and food, almost semi-urban visuals of shops displaying their wares all piled up and stocked up in a manner that hangs almost on your face as you walk past, and several vegetable vendors and provision shops with very basic infrastructural facilities along the road as you walk down. The stark contrast of this space within this small city state is almost unbelievable unless one experiences it. Yet, 
There's a seamless participation of diverse communities across the island and also beyond it in the marketplace as either shopkeepers or consumers at a very informal level. And the predominant lingua franca is either Tamil or Singlish. What may be interesting to look at is the business framework and patterns. Um, Okay, uh, yeah, uh, of this area through generations and its diverse businessmen. Now, this is a very interesting poster that I thought I would share with you. And I have, you know, there are very, I mean, lots of interesting pictures that I could have brought, uh, but there are copyright issues, so I cannot really show you. But this I thought was an interesting one, a poster in 1920 selling milk products. Um, quite visibly, there's a striking resemblance and legacy of certain sectors of business mostly catering to the everyday necessities in an Indian way of life. Um, now, talking about Indian way of life, perhaps I don't have much to explain now. We can do that in a QA and a if you want to. Um, thus, provision stores, restaurants, textile shops, flower and garland shops, and the jewelry shops have been the most prominent in the area. And this line of business still persists quite prominently, serving a diverse consumer base across ethnicities and culture. The owners' names of the shops and their sizes may have changed, but the components of the business have continued to remain familiar in the area. On the other hand, other occupations like that of milkmen, cattle traders, butchers, grinders, fortune tellers, one who formed an inevitable part of this area since the days of the colonial past into some decades of the post-independence phase, have eventually disappeared. Since the 1980s, heritage properties have been declared and worn-out buildings have been refurbished, with which helped maintain the architectural facade of the space. The Little India Arcade has been created, mainly with the tourists in mind, which houses a number of shops of Indian textiles and apparels, fashion accessories and costume jewelry, souvenir shops, and regional handicrafts from different places in India. Indian sweet shops and places for applying henna, as well as other utility items of everyday use in Indian way of life. Again, okay. Um, can we go to the next slide? I mean, these are images of the bygone days, which uh, 1960, 1980s. Um, except that the buildings seem a bit crowded, it doesn't make much of a difference uh, in visuals. Uh, we'll go to 1980s. Please. Next slide, please. Okay, now um, I've got these two slides talking about day to day business activities, which are, um, but there are some activities which you will not see anymore, like that of the Sikh charmer, like that of this person. Of course, those, those areas are uh, all readily available. Um, if I say it's not available, you'll just kill me maybe. But, um, but the kind of uh, the oven that he's using, using the charcoal, perhaps that has been modified. So, and his business operations, as you can see, a taxi right behind him. So this visual imagery uh, gives you an impression that it has uh, a part of the shop that is, uh, you know, a kitchen is, can be seen right in the front of the shop, which is not there right now. So it's an infrastructurally, it's a little bit modified, but of course those days are readily available. And other things, the business model has remained the same. Perhaps the structure of the shops have changed a bit. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah, here this I think is an interesting slide which talks about Okay, uh, which talks about uh, different, again, business activities in the area, again, in the 1980s. Here I would see that, uh, you know, again, the model of the business operations of a provision shop who is selling spices have remained. Again, the structure might have changed. This kind of business has disappeared from the area. Um, and at the same time, barbers, of course, are still there. And at uh, the same time, you can see, I mean, this uh, sharing of the space with uh, Chinese businessman has been there uh, since very old times. And here is a charcoal shop um, by a Chinese businessman uh, and a dry cleaning shop there. I mean, this is a kind of sharing of space, of interethnic uh, sharing of space that we see there. Also, um, the first, very first picture on your left, which uh, I, I thought was a in very interesting picture. We do have such shops even now, and um, which is a Muslim shop which frames Hindu, Muslim, uh, Hindu deities, and uh, and, and it's I, to me it is extremely interesting to say how this space has been uh, shared by different religious groups as well, and uh, you know the altar of a person of a, of a house or 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 a temple is the most sacred space, and there the Hindus or uh, this religion one religious group has no 
qualms about getting the image of, of the deity framed by another religious group. And that is quite accepted. I think this comes from the South Asian uh, 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 ethos of acceptance of different religious groups, whether we appreciate it or we fail to appreciate it at times. But it comes, uh, and it's not uh, particularly unique of Singapore, but it's available in, in entire South Asian uh, space. So I think this, the, this um, um, slide tells us a lot in that manner. One of the most important feature of this marketplace is its cost effectiveness. The maintenance cost and regular costs are much lower, almost basic when compared to supermarkets and malls in the other areas of the city. This is directly experienced by the consumer as well when he enjoys cheaper costs of vegetables, clothes, and other everyday necessities from elsewhere in the city. This is also one of the pull factors of the contract workers and domestic helpers to congregate um, in the vicinity on their holidays. However, one must bear in mind that most of the products are sourced locally or from neighboring areas and from India, and are not typically the branded items as is available in most of the supermarkets elsewhere in the city. While uh, one might like or dislike the bazaar or the common market type of infrastructure with hardly any facilities desirable in a global city like Singapore, he is most certainly relieved by the price differentiation. The profit margins are generally based on the larger quantity and wholesale prices rather than calculations on individual products. However, the items sourced exclusively from India do leave the businessmen with strong margins in individual products as well, with favorable exchange rates for Singaporean dollar in comparison to the Indian rupee. Uh, at the same time, one has to bear in mind that this bazaar is a niche marketplace for items mostly suitable for ones from the Indian subcontinent, be it a pressure cooker, Indian spices, bindis, henna, jimkis, or thalis. It may be noted in this context that in spite of the cost-effective infrastructure and wholesale price business model, there are issues regarding uh, the continuously rising rentals and the shopkeepers that the shopkeepers have to cope with, which is one of the main obstacles in the sustenance of many business activities uh, or initiatives in the area. Uh, now I'll go to the next slide, which I, I mentioned a few names, uh, um, popular names from the yesteryears and which have also continued in the present time. Two of the famous names in the early years of the 20th century are those of Ramasamy Nadar and Govinda Sami Pillai. Nadar was one of the wealthiest men in pre-war Singapore who resided in Buffalo Road area, present Teka Market area, where he had built a row of double-story houses for his family and relatives. Most of his wealth was accumulated through the supply of provisions to the estates all over Malaya, investments and investments in properties. However, his business could not be sustained by his descendants. P. Govindasami Pillai, or PGP, as he was popularly known as, uh, I had a very interesting picture of uh, PGP's shop. Again, I couldn't show you for obvious reasons. Um, started as an employee in 1908 in N. Ramasamy's Sari shop in Selgay Road. Eventually, he came to own a number of shops in the area selling provisions, medicine, canned items, textiles, and groceries. His main office was located 4850 Sarangun Road. That's, that's the stretch. A stretch of houses on Buff Buffalo Road, one of the biggest properties there, belonged to him. PGP was a philanthropist, initiating in building temples, wedding halls in Singapore, as well as in India. And he, I mean, his participation in a lot of temple activities are uh, well documented. Um, he was also one of the initial enthusiasts and founding member in building up the Indian Chamber of Commerce in Singapore. This I find is very significant because uh, not many from this, this area have participated in building up the Indian Chamber. Both he and his son, G. Ramachandran, actively participated in the Indian Chamber and its activities, which was distinct and different from the usual lack of enthusiasm among the Serengun Road businessmen for participation in the Indian Chamber's, um, Indian Chamber's role, or the growth of Indian cham Chamber. From 1960s onwards, name of the retail shops like those of Siti Vinayagar, VK Kalana Sundaram Sands, uh, stores were quite popular. Kalana Sundaram had a lot of shops in the area, while two of them were on... Oops, Buffalo Road, there were others on Dunlop Road and Serangoon Road. I mean, they sold textiles. And then you have MRPK, Van Der Aer and Sons. Um, the very popular Mustafa Center rose up from the same, almost at the same time from very humble beginnings. And most of uh, the shops that were owned uh, by, I, I think it's, um, it's Kalyana Sundaram. Some of the shops have been acquired by Mustafa over the years. Um, 
Um, I'm, I'm not going into details of the Mustafa Center. That's, that's a part of a case study that I've already made in my book, and we can talk about it on a different occasion. Another popular name is of O.K. Mohammad Hanifa, who started in 1962 from the textiles and then into jewelry as well as departmental stores. So he's quite a big name now. And Jyoti Stores and Flower Shop, of course, everybody who is uh, aware of this space is aware of this shop. Um, uh, and uh, business actually took a new turn. I mean, it was started by Ramachandra, M. Ramachandra, but it took a new turn when his son, Raja Kumar, a university graduate in computer science, joined in 1985. And Raja Kumar, he interacts with his customers um, regularly and tries to improvise on uh, the business operations. So you have Jyoti Holdings Private Limited, which was incorporated in 1992. He has also embarked on uh, branding his products. Um, the story of Little India, can we have the next slide, please? Um, it does, it's incomplete with, without the mention of restaurants, so there are some of these restaurants that I've mentioned. Komala Villas as far back as 1947, Ananda Bhavan almost at the same time, 1948-49. And um, from 1980s, of course, there's a new trend uh, of Rest Coast Road, where, which began serving, the restaurants began serving North Indian, South Indian, and the Chinese and Singaporean food. Now, uh, we have a group of uh, restaurants that cropped up then. Banana Leaf, Muthu's Curry, Gayatri Restaurant, Anjapar, which is more, res of course, more recent. And a number of North Indian, res uh, um, you know, other uh, restaurants coming up. Jaggi's uh, being most, uh, most popular. And others coming up um, eventually with North Indian cuisines and other things. Now, um, um, okay, we can go to the next slide. Um, I'll just uh, take mainly maybe one or two minutes for uh, the images from the past. I mean, this, this uh, picture on your left is, I thought, was interesting because uh, you can find the Arya Samaj building on the right, and so which is just opposite to the Mustafa Center. So uh, on the left is where Mustafa Center stands today, and it is 1982, and uh, you know, it's before the renovations and others. And this is also uh, Abdul Ghafur Mosque before its restoration. Oh, God. Um, next, next slide, please. Um, I cannot, uh, you know, uh, stop my presentation without mentioning Teka. I mean, this is Teka Market. Sorry. Uh, um, yeah. So this is this is another uh, focal point of of uh, Little India activities, which is very interethnic, and uh, you know, it cuts across religion and ethnicities and uh, the mingling of this place. It has been renamed several times. You can see Kandang Karbao, then Tekya Kha, and Teka Pasar, the Jujiao or Teka Center, and now we have the Teka Market. It has been recently refurbished. Let's go to, um, if you give me a few more minutes, I can talk about the gold jewelry business. I mean, now this is the redeveloping of conserving the community space, which there is a, you know, there's just an inner core and an outer core, and there are different uh, ways how these two are managed. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, this, this picture again shows very distinctly, this is the Indian, uh, Little India Arcade, which has come up, which I talked about in a minute ago, uh, housing different uh, Indian products. This, again, this picture again gives us a visual of the inner core and their outer core. You have a shopping mall right, right there and the outer core, uh, very uh, modern, different shopping mall, which, is, uh, which does not match with the fa facade of in Little India space. Uh, next, please. Uh, now, uh, if you give me, if the chairman gives me a few more minutes, can I, can I, two minutes? Okay, I'll just mention, show you the pictures and then say goodbye. Oh, you know, the gold jewelry business, uh, let's, let's go look at the next slide, please. Um, you can see from here, I have no time to talk about this. I mean, there are um, shops um, which are very old in the area. Uh, one of the oldest Chinese gold jewelry shop, can we go to the next slide, in Little India is that of Lam Kyang Ming, the owner of a familiar name to many. This is Batu Pahat, we can go to the next slide, which has been in ex uh, business in 19, since 1969. At present, Chinese businessmen comprise of about 80% of the gold jewelry business in the area. The increasing number of shops indicate lucrativeness of the business as well. All the shops sell ornaments almost exclusively Indian in design and targeting Indian clientele base. The reliance on gold ornaments as a part of the regular Indian way of life is immense. Whether it is for auspiciousness, status, asset value, or whether it is regarded as an essential element of religious and festive occasions. 
Uh, however, ornaments that are sold at present are mostly machine-made, smaller, lighter, with modern designs, custom and not custom-made that they were in the past. But Tupahat served as a training ground for many who owned, uh, who started their shops later on. Now I'll quickly talk about, this is Batu Pahat. He also has a pawn shop right next to him. I mean, these are very interesting uh, developments that have taken place uh, since 1960s, 70s, 80s, and so on. And recently, there are a number of gold shops in the area. Um, I have mentioned Mukuti Corner because this is one uh, shop which um, houses three generations of the goldsmiths. He is the second generation, Muthu Krishna. And uh, his uh, son is also uh, interested in the business, so, and I see him in the shop off and on. Now to just conclude, I, I don't have time for Lisha and anything, just uh, one minute. Intra-ethnic complexities exist significantly in this community space, yet the overarching Indian cultural ethos that exists is visually appealing and cannot be ignored. It also lends an element of homogeneity to this space in popular imagination. The competitive business models of different ethnic communities and their interactions in this contested community space has been a part of the landscape. The unique synergy of Little India has been built on the cultural practices and sentiments of the people from the Indian subcontinent and has diffused almost seamlessly into the multicultural canopy of Singapore. Thank you very much.